QuickBooks Online 2024. Add normal expenses to books from Bank Feed Limbo and Make Rules. Get ready and some coffee because we're getting the business on target with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our QuickBooks Online bank feed practice file we set up in a prior presentation. After setting up the QuickBooks Online practice file, we went into the transactions tab on the left hand side, the chart of accounts up top and then reduced or made inactive many of the accounts provided by QuickBooks Online, including many of the expense accounts, so that as we add transactions from what I call bank feed limbo, including the crucial piece of information so that we can add those transactions, that being the account, we can actually create the account at that point in time, customizing our chart of accounts. We also included a checking account and then we imported data that would be mirroring the similar type of transaction if we connected to the bank. In other words, resulting in transactions over here in the bank transactions tab in what I would call bank feed limbo. So now we have these transactions in what I call bank feed limbo that need that information that need the added account. And also as we're doing that, we should also be adding the customer or vendor uh, to this information. So we're gonna start doing that now. We're gonna start with the most basic type of transactions, the easiest type of transactions to automate, those being transactions where you're, they're monthly transactions, things like the utility bill, things like the phone bill, they're reoccurring. They will be made as easy as possible to create a rule for if we set up like electronic payments and basically automate those payments. That would be the easiest type of thing to do because then we'll see the information populate in the bank feed uh, memo over here and we'll see the amount and the date and we can just use the bank feeds in order to pull them into our accounting system. Let's first take a quick look at the QuickBooks desktop homepage, analyzing it for the QuickBooks online system, just trying to see where the bank feeds would fit into the normal flow of forms. We're thinking here about the vendor cycle or expenses cycle where at the end of the cycle, we would expect money to be going out which of course we would see through the bank feeds for goods and services that we're purchasing for the business. Now the easiest system usually to automate the entire thing with bank feeds would usually be a cash based type of system. Remembering that we can kind of think about the cash based system by cycle. So even if we're not on the cash based system for the revenue cycle, we might be on the cash based system. And oftentimes many small businesses will be on the cash based system for the uh, vendor cycle or expenses cycle. And that system, it would be easiest to try to set up the electronic transfers. And as the electronic transfers uh, clear the bank, that's when we actually record the transaction. Note that that's not exactly a full serviced accounting system because normally, for example, if you were to write actual checks, physical checks, we would enter the transaction when we write the physical check. And then when it clears the bank, which we would see with the bank feeds, we would match that transaction to the physical check we wrote. That gives us an added layer of internal control because now we have two separate institutions recording the same transaction. And if we can match those two up, then we, we have more assurance of the transaction. However, we're becoming more and more uh, comfortable relying on 
the electronic transfers and the time between the transfers are, are much shorter. So in other words, it would still be a full service accounting system if I was to pay the telephone bill with an electronic transfer to record it in QuickBooks when I do the electronic transfer with an expense form, which would be like a check form with no check number. And then when it clears the bank to match out what I recorded to the bank feeds. However, it's easier to say because there's such a short distance and I can basically check that electronic transfer within a day at least that to make sure that it clears that I'm just going to wait till it clears the bank and then be completely reliant on the bank to record the transaction. That's the transactions we'll look at right now. Those are the easiest ones to automate. Those are the easiest ones to basically build our books from the bank feeds. If we were going to enter a bill into the system, note that that is introducing an accrual component, the bill for QuickBooks increasing accounts payable. When you increase accounts payable with the bill, no cash is taking place and therefore the bank feeds would not be able to facilitate that transaction. We'll talk about that wrinkle in the future. First, the easy, the easy ones. Now on the filters up top, notice that I have all dates here, even though I have two months of information. And then oftentimes you might filter it by date, but then it might be easier to filter by the bank detail. If I filter by bank detail, then I can see the transactions that have the same detailed information. Also remember that I have in the settings, the thing that shows all the detail, uh, copy the detail, it shows the bank details so that I can see everything and not have QuickBooks try to truncate and guess what the most important thing for me to see is. I also might want to filter by decreases. So I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say this is a money out. I want to see all the money out rules. And then I can focus just on the money that's going out. And I have, for example, the, the, the SoCal Edison. So that looks like it's going to be a utility bill. So that one would be a, an easy one typically. So let's copy that. Notice it's putting it into owner's draws in part because we deleted the expense accounts and draws. Maybe they think that we're doing it for our personal uh, utilities or something rather than the business. But obviously that is wrong. So I don't want to just confirm that or it's, it's not going to record it properly, right? We have to assign the account. So the vendor, we don't have a vendor yet. So notice that down here, I can copy this information to create the vendor. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to put it here. Note that the entire memo is not what I'm going to copy the vendor from, but just the part that's going to be the vendor name, which oftentimes will be in the bank detail, which QuickBooks is now including in the memo, which is nice. What you don't want to have happen over time, however, is to, to copy multiple vendors, right? So you want to make sure that if you already have a vendor in place, then you, you choose that vendor uh, that, that you're going to be using so that, so that your vendor information isn't duplicated. Also note that if I do not include a vendor and I just include a category, note that the asterisk is indicating that's the only field I absolutely need to record the transaction. In other words, I can make the balance sheet and the income statement reports just by assigning a category, meaning an account. However, the only way I can assign an account typically is to see in the memo, the, a part of the memo, memo that tells me who the vendor is, uh, right? Because that's what's going to tell me what I spent the money on. So I know it's Edison. Therefore, I spent the money on utilities like the electric bill. I might as well also add the vendor, however, because I might want to search in my vendor center by who I paid, right? So that's still an added you, you want to add the vendors if you can. So I'm going to say there's the vendor. I don't need all the detail for the vendor right now because all I need is basically who I paid so I can search for who I paid in the detail. So I'm going to say save that. Now it's not going to go to owner draws. This is where I have to add a category. I'm going to add my expenses as we go. If I hadn't deleted all the expenses in QuickBooks, my method would be to search in the expenses to see if one is relevant uh, and if so, use that. If not, or if there's one relevant, but I don't like that it's a subcategory, or I don't like that uh, the name, then I would go into the chart of accounts and simply adjust the name instead of making a new account, which is similar but different, because then you're going to confuse yourself when you're entering transactions, because you might post two, uh, two transactions to the two accounts that are have a similar name. And then and only when there are not any expense accounts would I add one. 
But in our case, the, the best way to really customize this is to add the expense accounts as you go. And so we're going to do that as we go. Now, notice that this is Edison. So traditionally, I, I would have said that it, it used to be that utilities used to include all the kind of utilities, right? You could put under utilities, the gas bill, the electric bill, the telephone bill was often under there. Oftentimes these days, uh, it seems that the telephone bill is no longer really considered a utility because it's 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 its own thing. It's expensive now oftentimes for many businesses. And so I might break that one out. Uh, and so you can also just break out the Edison to an electric bill. That's another method that you might use. You might make a utility account and then put subordinate accounts under the utilities account. To me, I like just having uh, a utility account for like the electric and the gas, for example. Uh, so I'm just going to say those are my utilities. I'll put them into one account. I'm going to say, boom, this is going to be an expense type of account. So we're going to say duh, duh, expense. And this subcategory, not typically the most important category. So uh, it's a detail type. So I'm just going to put other, other expenses. There probably is a utility down here, utilities. Let's do that. Utilities. I don't need another description. I'm not going to make it a sub account. Now, if I did make a parent account, of utilities and then one of the electric as a subordinate account to it, then I can create the utilities account. I'd have to do that separately from the chart of accounts and then make the other one subordinate to it by choosing a, a subsidiary account here. But I'm just going to put it directly into the utilities. I think that's the cleanest way to do that. I don't like to get over overboard or go overboard or have too many sub accounts because I think, you know, if I don't need a sub account, then I'd rather not have the more uh, detail on it unless it's appropriate, right? I don't know. So the, the, this is where a lot of the judgment comes in. There's no set rule as, as to how your accounts should be lined up. For example, if I was in a business where the electric bill was really important because I was growing plants or something with neon lights that with, that are gonna take up a lot of energy, then I would make the, the, the this, this one wouldn't be utilities. This would be a very important expense that I would say, this is my electric bill. It's really important. It's not just under this miscellaneous or grouped together with the gas bill, right? Because these two being grouped together is basically saying they're, they're not as large an expense and therefore I can group them in one category. So let's go ahead and save that. And then if there were tags, I can add tags. These are kind of like uh, classes, class tracking. Uh, if you needed to do that, we have a whole nother section or course on, on tags and class tracking, location tracking, if you want to look at that in more detail. If we need to add an attachment, we can add an attachment and we can create a rule, which we will do. We can exclude it. Uh, we can categorize. This is the history. Now note that the default here is a, categ is a categorize. Uh, and that means it's going to make an expense form, which is like a check form. Check forms decrease in the checking account without a check number. The other is match. We'll talk more about that later. Transfer and if it was a credit card. So you're usually going to be using this one for electronic transfers for normal kind of decreases to the checking account. Now, once I have this populated, I can create a rule. Now you want to create the rules because this is the thing that's going to automate uh, your transaction. So I need a rule name but, and we'll talk more about rules specifically later, but we'll go into the basics of the rules here. So we're going to say a rule name. I'm going to copy the the vendor name, so SoCal Edison, and then I'm going to say apply this rule to transactions that are, it's all money out, not money in, so these are decreases to the checking account. I can apply to all bank accounts or just the one that I'm in. Now, I only have one bank account, but if I had multiple bank accounts, I could apply the rule across them all, or I could apply the rule just to the account that I am on. And then... Uh, and include the following. So these rules down below, I could say if I have multiple rules, say I can add another one. So if I have multiple rules down here, I could say, hey, look, if it meets any of these rules, then these conditions, then I want you to apply the rule. Or I can say that it has to meet all the rules. So all the rules would be more constraint, a bigger constraint. You'd have to meet all rules in order to apply it. Or you have to meet any of the rules, which would be a less constraint in order to apply the rules. We'll get into more detail about uh, how you might construct those for more complex rules later. 
oftentimes the default of all rules will will be fine because you're only going to have one of them, right? So if it's the Edison, I only want one rule. If you see if you see that in the description, if you see, and I like choosing the bank text. So if you see the bank text, because the bank text includes all the detail, not just what QuickBooks thinks is relevant, right? In terms of what might be the vendor name or customer name. If within the bank text, it contains, meaning it has within it, uh, but it doesn't mean that that's all that's in there or doesn't contain, which is, you know, that might be useful if you had multiple rules uh, or is exactly, I don't need it to be exact. I just need it to contain the name because remember it's going to have all this other jargon at the end of it. So I just want the name SoCal Edison. If you have that, apply the rule. I'm not going to add any other condition. Most rules just need one condition. We'll talk about more complex rules later. I can test the rule. So if I test it, it says this rule will apply to two currently uh, unreviewed transactions. Perfect. And then down here, we have the transaction type. I, it was an expense account. The category that we set up has been pulled in here when we when we started entering the transaction. The split, uh, we'll talk more about the split uh, possibility later, which could give you more capacity for complex transactions, possibly the utility bill being split between, say, a couple accounts because, because you have two different departments or something like that, or between two different class trackings because you have you're using class tracking for departments or something. So you paid, uh, when you paid, uh, who you paid, I'm gonna say SoCal Edison as the vendor. Uh, if I have tags, I can add tags to the rule, uh, replace bank memo. So this pulled in from the bank memo. I could put something other than that in the, in the memo, but I'm gonna keep that as the memo. Also keep existing uh, bank memo. I'm going to keep it unchecked as the as the default so hopefully it'll pull in the current bank memo for the following transactions and then then i can clear it down here this is important automatically confirm transactions that match these conditions once they're downloaded from the bank so in other words do i want quickbooks to just apply this rule and then take it out of bank feed limbo and 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 add it to our system automatically or no, I would start off with no, right? I'd start off saying, I don't want you to do that because if I do that, all these transactions are gonna be assigned. And if there's an error, like if you did this for a whole year's worth of transactions, then it's gonna assign all the whole year's worth of it. So I'd like to say first, no, I'm gonna check it. And then possibly when I become confident with the rule, then maybe I'll go back into the rule and add that in place. All right, so I'm gonna say, let's save it. And now you can see that, uh, let's see, let's see. We have these two here for SoCal and it says here, rule applied, rule applied. I also have my sorting options now. So if it was a, a money out, I can say rule applied. I can sort by rule applied. And there's the two that have uh, the rule applied to it. Let's try to add just like one of them and see what it does to my financial statements. So when I add this, it's actually gonna enter a transaction adjusting my financial statements. It should also move it from the review to categorized. And so let's go ahead and say, uh, uh, duh -duh. so we reviewed it and then we're gonna say confirm. Confirm, roger that. And then, so let's see, uh, it went, f it, now we're down to 19 here and under categorized, we see that one that has now been moved to the categorized. Now, remember if I log out and log back in, this one that has been categorized might be removed because it's not gonna keep it here basically forever. But there it is when we're currently working on it. Let's go back to the first tab. And then I'm gonna go up top, right click on the tab up top to duplicate it so I can open up the reports and look at the impact on them. So we'll open up the reports on the left, the major two reports being the balance sheet and the income statement. So I'm gonna close up the hand boogie. Here's the balance sheet. I'm gonna right, let's right click on the income statement first. I'll right click on the income statement and then I can open a link in a new tab. It's gonna open up top. I'm also gonna open the balance sheet. Now this is the format I usually use uh, whenever I'm working. I'm gonna open two tabs so that I have the balance sheet and the income statement uh, to the tabs to the right. And then the tab on the left is my data input tab. So now every time I add something, I can go to the financial statements, look at the impact on the financial statements. 
So if I do that, I go over here. Every time I go over here, I'd have to refresh it. I can change the date range going from 010124 to 022924. And then I can, uh, I might want to see it by months, month by month might be interesting to look at. And so when we start adding two months of data and then in the checking account, if I drill down on it, this is what's great about QuickBooks. I can now see, I can deconstruct. Here's the end result. Here's what we're making drill down on it and then here is the transaction so the transactions from the checking account gives us the date the transaction type expense form that's the typical form for a decrease to the checking account that will be used the name the description uh, the full name the other side what's the other account going to there's always two accounts affected with every transaction it's going to the utilities account which is an expense account if i drill down on it it doesn't take me to the bank feeds it takes me to an expense form. So uh, one online banking matches and then SoCal Edison payee. If we tab through this, this is the same date, right? We had the payee. We had it going out of the checking account because that's the bank feed that we were in when we recorded it. The date, it doesn't have a payment type because that wasn't part of the information in, uh, in the bank feed form. So you could choose a payment type here, but reference because it was an electronic transfer, right? And then there's no tags, but if we added a tag, it would be here. And here's the categories down below. It was in the utilities and the description. And if there were multiple categories, that's what the split in the rule would do. If there were multiple categories that it needed to go to, allowing us to assign to multiple accounts and possibly multiple classes. Uh, if we had class tracking on, note that we don't have items. Items would be inventory items and items complicate the bank feeds. So if we had items, then we would probably have to do something a little bit more complicated because we would have to track the units of inventory if we're purchasing items instead of assigning directly to the account. We might talk about that more later. In the memo, we have our memo. No attachments have been attached. We can cancel, revert, make reoccurring, more, and so on. So there it is. Let's go ahead and close that out. Do you want to leave without saving? I don't think I changed it. Let's go back. Notice when I'm navigating back, I'm not going to this back button here but everything within QuickBooks is typically within QuickBooks. So I'm gonna to go to this back button. That takes me back to the balance sheet. The other side of the balance sheet you can see is down here on the equity side. So you can see within equity, it put it into this net income on the equity. So this makes sense because if we look at the accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus equity, so assets is what the company has. Liability and equity is the flip side of the coin. Who has claim to the value that the company has? Well, right now we have a negative value because we have negative cash because we haven't put any of the deposits in. And we don't have any liabilities yet because we haven't put anything in there for liabilities, such as a bank loan uh, or a credit card. And therefore, the whole value is part of equity, which means that the owner, in essence, owes the company money, right? Because it's overdrawn. It's a negative amount uh, in equity at this point in time. So that's the general, that's the, that's the accounting equation. Now this net income is being pulled from the detail of the income statement. So if I go to the income statement and we run that for, let's say going from 010124 to 022924, let's look at it by a month by month basis as well. Run it. So now we have an expense in January. It's under utilities. That's the account that we added. If I go into that expense, then we have our uh, utilities here. If I drill down on that, it takes me to that same expense form. Every transaction has at least two accounts affected that will impact the accounting equation going back in this format. Now, this is the net income. How is the income statement tied to the balance sheet? How is it connected to the accounting equation? Assets equal liabilities plus equity. It's given us the detail about the equity side, the equity side of the balance sheet. Now the equity side of the balance sheet often confuses people because uh, it could have a different name over here depending on what type of entity we have. So if it's equity for a sole proprietor, this probably shouldn't be called retained earnings. It should be called like owner's equity. And then, and then if it was a corporation, it would be, it would be called retained earnings. If it was a uh, partnership, you might have multiple people that have claim to the equity. So why is that confusing? Because if you think about equity as a total, 
it's what owners have claimed to the to the to the assets of the business but then you have to think about how do you break that out between owners well if there's only one owner then it's a sole proprietor and that's fairly straightforward if you have a partnership you could have like multiple owners you might have five partners then you have to track different capital accounts for each of the partners according to the revenue sharing and draws and investments that they have made if it's a corporation it's actually easier than i mean a part if it's a if it's a corporation it's actually easier than a partnership oftentimes because then although there's multiple people that own the business you're breaking up the equity the net value in the business into equal unit shares like dollars and then you say who has what depending on who has more of the shares right that's kind of easier to do than a partnership uh, typically oftentimes also note that this net income will roll into retained earnings on a yearly basis that's quickbooks closing the books out automatically so if i take this from 010125 to 0101 uh 010125 run it it moves from the net income into retained retained earnings it's just closing out the books that net income really shouldn't even be on the balance sheet but it's quickbooks trying to tie out the income statement to uh the equity so we can see what is happening let's go back from 010124 uh, to uh 022924 run it Okay, so you can see that I don't need the actual vendor to run these reports. However, the vendor could help us because if I go to the tab to the left and I go in and you'll recall that we added the vendor. So if I go into my expenses, which I would call the vendor center, then I can go into my vendors up top and I can actually, I didn't, where's my vendor? Let's go into my expenses over here. I could see my expense here and the payee is uh, the SoCal Edison. So I can, I can sort my information in the expenses area uh, over on this side. Okay, I refreshed my screen. I think the vendor is gonna show up now. So I don't have any bills because that would be an accrual thing. I didn't enter a bill. I just entered an expense form from the bank feeds. If I go into my vendors, I get my vendor layout and then I can go into SoCal Edison here and if I wanted to look at the transactions that were paid to that particular vendor, that could be useful information. That's why it's, that's why you want to add the vendors, even though they're not a required field, just to add the information into the bank, into the system. So let's open this up again. Let's go back to the transactions and I can close this and let's do at least one more here. Let's do, uh, we have Veri the Verizon is the other you know, really common one, right? So if I go into Verizon and we do the same thing, it's going to be a category making an expense form. Who's going to be the vendor? I have one vendor now. That's not the one. I'm going to copy the part of the memo that I think is going to be the vendor, paste that into the vendor, create a vendor for that. That's who we paid. All I need is this name. That's all I really need. I need, that's the telephone company. I'm going to save it like that. And then what I really need to record this is the category. The vendor, although not required, but something you want to add in order to record the transaction uh, is going to be something you need in order to determine the category. Verizon is a telephone provider. Therefore, I'm going to assume it goes into telephone expense. If I already had the accounts from QuickBooks, I would then look at QuickBooks accounts to see if they have a telephone. In our case, we're going to create our own accounts, noting that the telephone used to be under utilities, but now because it's expensive, it usually has its own place. So I would just give it its own account. You could still make it a subordinate account to utilities, but I feel like telephone should be its own account. So I'm gonna add my account as I go. It's gonna be a, uh, a expense type of account. And then they probably have a telephone here. Uh, I'll put it under utilities again, I'll call it telephone and I'm not going to make it subordinate to any other account but if I wanted to make it subordinate to the utilities account I could if I wanted to make the utilities a parent and then make the SoCal Edison or the electric subordinate and then make this subordinate that's another method I could use I'm going to save that and then I'm, I don't have any tags the memo is pulling in I'm not going to do any attachments I will add a rule I'm going to add the rule and then what's the rule going to call 
I'm just gonna call it usually what the vendor name is. So I'll copy the vendor name, tab, it's a money out rule. There's only gonna be one rule, or it's gonna apply to all accounts, that's fine. And then I'm just gonna say all instead of any, cause I'm only gonna have one rule. I'm gonna say the rule is gonna be pulling from the bank text so that I can pull all the information, including the numbers. And I want it to contain, which is the default, rather than be exact or doesn't contain. And then I'm just gonna put usually the name of the vendor, deleting all the other gobbledygook because that other stuff may not be the same as we go to multiple transactions. So I just needed to contain Verizon. If you find that, apply the rule. We're not gonna add any other conditions. We'll talk about other conditions later. Test the rule. Two of them are applied. That looks appropriate. Assign expense account, category, telephone. I don't need a split because I don't need it to be split between two expense accounts or anything like that or two classes. Who did you pay? I'm gonna put Verizon here, tags, no tags. I'll keep the memo. And once again, uh, I don't wanna confirm it automatically. I wanna check it and possibly then adjust that later. So I'm gonna save that. And then I can see these two on the Verizon now has the rule applied. Let's do the one for January, review. And then I'm gonna say confirm. And so that should pull that transaction from the review to the categorized. So now I've got the two in the categorized. Also note the rules are located over here. So here's the rules. So now I can, I can go to the rules. There's my two rules. If I wanna edit these rules, I can edit them here and then adjust them. So later on, if I wanna make it auto confirm from this point forward, I can do that. So I'm gonna close that out, go into my balance sheet, run it. Same kind of thing if I drill down on the checking account, going from the end result, I can see how it was constructed. And I'm going from uh, January 1st, what happened to my dates? I'm going from 010124 to 022924. Let's run it. And then, okay, now I'm gonna check it out. And so now I've got these two transactions. So here's the Verizon. Here's the checking account. It's an expense type form, transaction type. That transaction type is useful because you can filter. We'll talk about that maybe later. Verizon. And then if I drill down on this, the other side's going to the telephone, it'll take me to an expense form, not to the bank feed data input where we have the Verizon, the date, and then uh, the category uh, down here. It should be categorized telephone. There it is. For some reason, I think it's some zoomed in or something. I'm gonna close that out. And then I'm gonna go back. And then the other side's on the profit and loss. Profit and loss, I need to refresh it so it, so it populates. Now we have my two expenses on the income statement. Here's my telephone, drilling down on it. And then there's my telephone, drill down on that. Takes me once again to the expense form, or it should, here we go. Go into the expense form, there it is. Every transaction, will typically be using some form. These are the forms, usually an expense form for money out and then uh, a deposit form for money in. And so then I'm gonna go back. This is what I have on my net income, a loss of 146. How is the income statement tied to the balance sheet? Because on the balance sheet, the income statement is the equity side. It's the detail of the equity side, which is just one number over here, net income, broken out to the activity, assigning income and expense categories on the income statement. So now the checking account is showing as overdrawn because I've only entered two expenses. There's no liabilities. Therefore, that in total responsibility of the overdrawn account is applicable to equity which should be in retained earnings, but is currently in net income because QuickBooks breaks out the net incomes to try to show you the relationship between the profit and loss and the income statement, which will roll into retained earnings on a yearly basis because QuickBooks closes out the income statement to retained earnings automatically on a yearly basis. All right, so if I go back to the tab to the left, open the handbookie and I go into my uh, expenses, which is gonna be my, my vendor center. I can now look over here if I needed to search for an expense form or something like that to see the transactions, I have the capacity to search by form and I have the payee, which is useful. 
Then I can go to the bills. I don't need bills because we haven't entered any bills because we're not doing an accrual thing. If I go into the vendors, we now have our two vendors. If I needed to go into Verizon because I have a question about the payments to Verizon, it is useful that I added the payee because then I can go in here and check it out even though the payee isn't required to add the transaction and to create the financial statements, balance sheet income statement from those transactions. All right, let's go back to the, to the button up top, the hamburger, and let's go to the transactions again. So I'm gonna go back to the bank feeds. And so, so we'll continue on this next time. And uh, I should probably note that on the chart of accounts, if I go to my chart of accounts, we have now added, you can see the balance here down below, you can see that we have added these accounts as we go. So there's the telephone, there's uh, the utilities. If I wanted to add a parent account and make another account subordinate to it, I would first have to go in here and make a new account, something like an expense account. I won't actually record this. And then if I wanted to make a parent of the utilities account, or let's just, and let's call it utilities too, just to see a difference. If I wanted to make this subordinate, so if I wanted to make the parent, I can make it a parent. If I wanted to make this the subordinate account of a utilities account, I could do that, right? And so, so then, so that's how you can create that tiered system. It'll create a sub account, but uh, I don't need that right now. So I will not do that. And that's where we stand at this point in time. Those are the most basic type of transactions that we can uh, enter those those cyclical transactions that you pay electronically, such as uh, utility bills, you want to make the rules as you go. And then once I become comfortable with those transactions, I can even automate those rules so that I don't even have to review it if I don't want to, I kind of like to sometimes still, but I can automate the rules so they, they then become automated, automatic going forward, but you have to set them up properly. Otherwise the automation is gonna work against you and not for you. We'll continue on with more of these in future presentations.